Is there somebody out here? Yeah. Who is it? Up. <laughs> Thomas, you were supposed to get here earlier. <laughs> I have a confession. I was on time, and my wife called me and said, my keys are in your car. <laughs> and I said, really? <laughs> and I just turned back around. Uh, well, here I am. We love you, though. It doesn't matter. It's good. All right. <clears throat> You know, <laughs> thank you, Thomas. Uh, sometimes people will ask me, <clears throat> why, why do you dress up like you do when none of the other preachers are doing that? I went to the uh, crew car wash this week. My car was filthy. And so I went in there and amazingly all of the workers were dressed in suits and ties. They looked really sharp and I commended them on how they look. And, and I thought you know, preachers, preachers have got to set an example. And so Tony and I try to do that. And I am so pleased that, that uh, my friend comes and preaches the word this morning. God bless you, Tony, as you preach. Thank you, Larry. Brother Larry, Pastor Larry, Pastor Huffman. <laughs> I'll get it right here. I keep fishing. Good to see you all today. I haven't done so much toe tapping since I was here a month ago. Uh, this music gets you going. I love that. Good music. Great music. By the way, uh, it doesn't matter what you write down for your funeral. Your kids will change it probably, so it doesn't. But it'll make you feel better. I've seen that happen over 40 years. <laughs> or they can't find the paper, one of the two. <laughs> but we're delighted to be here. And it's amazing, uh, you know, sometimes when pastors get older, uh, like your pastor, they're not as sharp dressing, but boy, he just stays right with it, doesn't he? It's amazing. And uh, he's a challenge to all of us. Somebody asked me, I preached at our church down in uh, South Side Christmas Sunday, and somebody said, now, we're going to dress casual today. Uh, what are you going to do? And... Uh, so I said, well, you'll have to come to find out. So I couldn't. I got there. I had my regular tie on. And, and uh, I said, I don't think I could preach Sunday morning in any church without a tie on. That's just what I've done. I don't, I don't judge people that do. Uh, but it's just me, and uh, that's the way I was brought up. But we want you here no matter what you wear. Tie, no tie, shirt, white shirt. Everyday, it doesn't matter. We're just glad you're here. We just kind of, in fact, that's kind of what my message is about. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 17. By the way, it's good to meet uh, the Huff Hands' great grandson. I thought for a minute when I saw him that I had seen him in camp up at uh, up up at uh, Mishawana, Mishawana Baptist Camp, uh, and then I realized and I asked and found out that. Tanner's Troy's son, and it was Troy that uh, was up there during those years when I was going up to camp with your dad. <laughs> so I haven't met you, but anyway, good to meet you. Good to have you here today. And we have some wonderful memories of those those days up at uh, the camp. Uh, Pastor Huffhan was the camp director for many years, and uh, I just got in on the kind of the tail end of it for the last four or five years where they really had something going. And uh, it was a great experience. We'll never forget it. What I want to talk about, uh, we read the passage, and just focus in on Luke chapter 17, verse 10 with me, if you will, please. So likewise you, when ye shall have, re have done all these things which are commanded you, say, and this, these are words of Jesus. Of course, he's using a, a parable here, illustration from life, 
uh, about servants and what they do and, and what their attitude is and what's expected of them. And when you've, done all, when you've done all the things that you've been commanded to do, you can say to yourself, so to speak, we're unprofitable servants. We've done that which was our duty to do. Father in heaven, this is a blessed hour. These are your people, thy people, your children. This is uh, your church. And I pray that thou wouldst be with us in presence and in power. This preacher is weak, but you are strong. And I pray that you'd make your strength known through my weakness today. And we're all weak, but we need strength. We need to hear from you. So bless us. Anoint our ears to hear and this tongue to speak and our hearts to believe. And I pray that you, you would reach our hearts today, Lord, with, as we start a new year with a challenge that we know is an old one, but yet it never ceases to be necessary for us to review it. We are never saved so long that we don't need to go back to the fundamentals. And so I pray that you would help us this morning to listen, to hear, to receive, to believe, to be changed by your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Open the gate, my boy, said the writer who headed the hunting party over in a countryside of England years ago. I'm sorry, sir answered the boy, but my father sent me to say that you must not hunt on his grounds today. Do you know who I am, son? demanded the man gruffly. No, sir, answered the boy. I am the Duke of Wellington. The boy took his cap off to the great man, but he did not open the gate. The Duke of Wellington would not ask me to disobey my father's orders, said the boy quietly. And a big smile came across the great man's face, and he tipped his hand, hat to the boy and said, I am proud of a boy that will not disobey his father's orders. And he and his party rode off to another place to do their hunting. It was his duty. He said, I'm proud. He said, I'm, I honor the boy who is faithful to his duty. Faithful to his duty. I honor that boy, the Duke of Wellington. Well, I think the Lord would honor, as we read in this parable, those who have been faithful to their duty. Webster defines duty as that which one is bound to by any legal or natural or moral obligation to pay, to do, or perform. Now, most of us would not like to think that we're doing what we're doing because uh, we're bound to by any legal or even moral. We just, we, we're here today because we love the Lord. That's what motivated us to come. But then, on second thought, duty is the right word. We are called servants by the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter, James, John, Jude, and probably all the apostles, although we know the ones that wrote these epistles, identify themselves right up front as servants, even the great apostle, as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is a good word. We render service as a matter of duty. We love the Lord Jesus, but we also know that it's our duty. Webster also said, like it or not, as believers, we're duty-bound. I quote, a sense of duty pursues us ever. It is omnipresent, like the deity. If we take it, if we take to ourselves the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, duty performed or duty violated is still with us for our happiness or our misery. If we say that the darkness shall cover us, uh, even the darkness, as in the light, our obligations are yet with us. Now, duty is, as a word, duty is only found a, a few times in the Bible, this being one of them. Another one is, is, is in Exodus chapter 3, verse 21, that talks about the duty of marriage. When you enter into the covenant of marriage, you uh, assume certain obligations. It's called, interestingly, duty. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul uses the word do benevolence. It's the same thing. We, uh, we are to honor our spouses 
and give them due benevolence, word for duty. Back in Ezra chapter 3, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, yes, Ezra chapter 3. No, I'm going to go to Second Chronicles chapter 8. Second Chronicles chapter 8. The word duty is used. I want to read it to you because it was, it's interesting. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 8 and verse 14. Uh, the occasion was the dedication of the temple that, uh, that Solomon was able to, to see through to the finish, the building of it. And when that, that temple was dedicated, there was a great feast of uh, worship and, and praise and offerings to God. And Solomon, it says in verse 12 of that chapter, Second Chronicles chapter, Solomon offered burnt offerings unto the Lord on the altar of the Lord, which he had built before the porch, even after a certain rate every day, offering according to the commandment of Moses, on the Sabbaths and the new moons, and on the solemn feast three times in the year, even in the Feast of Unlimited Bread, and in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles. And he appointed, according to the order of David his father, the courses of the priests to their service, and the Levites to their charges, to praise and to minister before the priest as the duty of every day required. <laughs> there's that word, duty. As the, and so you can see there's a, there's a regular order there. Uh, the priests, the service, the Levites to their charges, uh, the praise and minister before the priest and it, it, as the duty required. Duty's not altogether bad. By the way, that same thought is going to be repeated in Ezra chapter 3, verse 4, and I'll get to that in just a minute. So there is, there's the word duty. Uh, then the final uh, time that that word is, occurs in the Bible is Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter. And, you know, that's the story of uh, Solomon seeking pleasure from every kind of source under the sun. Anything you can imagine that he could think of, he, he did not deny himself. It was, Ecclesiastes, it was not, it was a, it's a good book, it's a great book, there's great lessons, but he was not, <laughs> he was not on his best spiritual game when he was reciting what he was doing during this period of his life. But anyway, he comes to the conclusion, he said this is the conclusion of the whole matter as he wound that, that book down and said, I've tried everything, and by the way, everything under the sun is vanity. It's vanity. It's like a puff of smoke. It's here now and gone in a minute, in an instant. Everything. And he said, here's the conclusion. He says the conclusion is fear God and keep his commandments. That's the whole, that's the sum of it. Fear God. Uh, the duty, the duty of man is to fear God and to keep his commandments. I think I probably misquoted that, but you can look it up. The word, I think, duty does occur there. Uh, I'll get it in just a minute. Ecclesiastes, here it is. Uh, let me read it to you. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. There we go. The, the whole duty. It's our duty. We fear him because we, we, uh, are, we stand in awe of his presence. We fear him because he's our creator. We fear him because we know his son died for us on the cross. We, but it's our duty. We, it's the whole duty of man. Now, I want, having that said that, I want to just, this is kind of my New Year's message to the uh, Pleasant View Baptist Church of Noblesville. I didn't, and I I listened to Pastor Hovans via online his stream, and it was a great message. I've always I, we always enjoy listening. There's two three preachers we listen to every week, and one of them is Pastor Huffhan, and uh, it's a great thing if you can't be here in person, and we want you to be here in person. But if you can't, just tune in uh, Sunday afternoon or Monday or whenever whatever day of the week. So we listen to that, and it was a great New Year's kickoff. But Here's mine as a pastor, as not your pastor, but as a preacher. Uh, here's my message. Uh, we have a duty of un undaunted service to the work of Christ. We, it's our duty uh, to have, having put our shoulder to the plow, walk, work straight ahead, keep at it, be faithful, uh, doing the same thing over and over may become repetitious but it's still I mean, that's what that passage in second chronicles you know 
uh, every month, uh, every day, certain things were to be done by the priest and uh, those who ministered in the in the temple. So, but it, yes, it was repetitious. You know, when you do something repetitious, it can become just that repetitious. You know, when you come to church, and by the way, it's mostly just a matter of attitude. When we come here to our service here today, we could think, okay, uh, we're going to sing two or three songs, and we're going to sing the the chorus, and we're going to sing praise God if we want blessings flow, and we'll have a special and a preacher will preach, and about a quarter of twelve, if we're lucky, we'll be done. Yeah, and it, it can be just come something that we are used to going through, and becomes maybe just repetitious, even coming to church on Sunday, and then uh, the COVID uh, the pandemic hit, and we found out that, oh, wait wait a minute, that which was repetitious and we did every Sunday of our life, there were some times where we couldn't, we couldn't go. There were times when we were ordered not to go, and some churches did anyway, and that's good too. But, and there were times when we just were not, we thought it would be wise not to. So that which was repetitious, we found out was, <laughs> it changed our lives when we couldn't do the repetitious. There's nothing wrong with duty. Now I'm going to go to Ezra, uh, Ezra chapter three and verse four, because it's a similar it's a similar thing. Because now they're the uh, captives are coming back from captivity. They've been there seven years. They're coming back under the decree of Cyrus the king. He said you can go back, and he even helped them to go back. And they were going to rebuild the destroyed uh, temple that was in rubbles and shambles, and the walls and so forth. Uh, notice in chapter 3 of Ezra, verse 1, if you're there, And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josedak, and his brethren the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheotiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of, the, of God, the God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings thereon, as is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Praise God. They got said, we got to get the altar reestablished. we got to get rebuilt. And, and we're going to worship God uh, as Moses, the man of God, told us to in the law. And they set the altar upon his bases, for fear was upon them because of the people of, the, of, the, of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the feast of the tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the class duty of every day required. There was a duty, a daily duty. Just call it our daily duty. You know, we have daily duties. Just in life, there's daily duties. <coughs> Somebody probably has to Somebody's taken it upon himself in your house to empty the trash, and, and somebody uh, makes the bed, and somebody vacuums the floors, and somebody washes the dishes, and somebody does this, that, and the other. There's, there's just duties to do if you're going to have an orderly life, and orderly house is part of it. Daily duties. It can, it, it can become repetitious. It can be monotonous. It can become just, you know, Daily duties, one day after another, the same thing, the same place, the same offerings <laughs> at the same time. Uh, daily. And so if we let ourselves get into the trap of this is just monotonous, it's not exciting. You know, it's exciting if you come to the house, though, if you pray to God and say, oh, God, speak to my heart. May this be a special day. May this be a day. And, you, and you've got, already gotten into his word. And you've been singing his songs, not only Sunday morning, but through the weekend. And then to come together with God's people where you can shake hands and, and give a holy hug or receive a hug and see a smile, a genuine greeting. My goodness. And to hear this music, that is exciting if you let it be. If you come in the right attitude, if you come in the right spirit, that's exciting. It's not monotonous. It's not repetitious. It's a glorious opportunity, but it could become just monotonous. And, by the way, there's a lot in life that's duty that is not only repetitious and monotonous, it's, a lot of it is just inglorious. You know, we don't receive any special recognition, not that we expect it, 
But we just, it's just, we know that God takes note if we do a kindness, if we are faithful, if we are dutiful. And we don't really expect others to, but it's just, you know, that the world is, and especially Christendom, our believers, so full of people that do faithfully inglorious tasks. Now, when we've done all of that, Jesus said, just consider yourselves uh, unprofitable service, servants. You haven't done anything extraordinary. We haven't. If we do whatever we do, it's just... Because we're his servants. He's called us to serve. He's put us into his vineyard and given us a job to do. Uh, but inglorious, and I th- when I think about the inglorious service, and by the way, there's, there's going to be a day when, I'll get to it later, uh, when those who are faithful even unto death are going to receive the crown of glory. That's when, that's when you get your people who are faithful receive glory that's that's all that matters is it not just to hear jesus say well done and then to have a crown a crown of glory or a crown of life that we can cast at jesus feet oh that will be glory for me glory for me glory for me when by his face i shall when by his grace i shall look on his face that will be glory be glory for me that's all that matters But in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 24, David had been, he was on the run from Saul. He and his uh, 400 soldiers, his arm, his band of soldiers. And he hooked up with a a Philistine king, uh, Achish, I believe was his name, took a liking to David and said, you can stay here for a while. He probably figured he'd be safe from Saul. So David and his band stayed there for a while. They were they were running uh, from Saul, and they were hiding from him at this point. And while they were gone, uh, another band of uh, soldiers came and destroyed the city that David had left his family and his wife, his wives, and uh, his whole, all of his family destroyed it. And some uh, he some some Egyptian had escaped this this band of uh, Ziklag was their name was his name the Amalekites had escaped their terror and came upon David and his his men and told them what had happened. He said uh, he said that the uh, Amalekites had destroyed the city had smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. That's where David's family was. Had smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. Wow. That's a terrible, you know, David's family. They, they, they took captive all the women and burned the city and, and, and took some, burned the city. So David and his men uh, mounted their horses and they took off to catch up because the Egyptians said that he could lead them to where they were, where they were, where they were camping. They, they went, they got there, and they destroyed the, uh, the army that had destroyed Ziklag. They re- rescued the women, and they took a lot of spoil uh, back home with them. Now, there were some people that didn't go because they were, too, they were just too plain weak. They were exhausted from running from Saul and from fighting, and so a couple hundred of them stayed back. 400 went with David, and uh, they got the victory, and they got they defeated the the enemy, and they res- and they rescued their wives, and and they came back with a lot of spoil. When they got back there, David began to divide the spoil up, and uh, he gave the people the 200 that stayed back as much spoil as those who went out and fought the battle. And some of the people began to murmur and say, wait a minute, these guys, they didn't even go out to fight with us. They stayed back. You're not going to tell me they get as much as, as we, as we uh, got. And notice what David said. Verse 23 of 1 Samuel chapter 3. David said, you shall not do so, my brethren, <coughs> with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into, into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter, but as is his part that goeth down to the battle, 
so shall be his part that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statue and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. So sometimes your job, your duty is to just lay low. Sometimes it is to stay by the stuff. You can't get out the, where the action is. You'd like to be out where the action is. Uh, and sometimes as we are aware, as and turn another calendar over year, we're older, another year older, our, our bones don't feel quite as strong as they once did. We can't, we're not in the, we're not on the front lines. We're, we're not where the action is, but we're by the grace of God staying by the stuff. And that's what really matters when, when we talk about duty. God's given some a duty to be out on the front lines. He's given some a duty to sweep the floor. He's given some a duty to pass the offering plates. He's given some a duty to sing in the choir. He's given some a duty to preach the gospel and to be up front and to be where the action is and to be a part of the music. He's given some the, the duty of just opening the door. By the way, David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Amen. <laughs> if I could just stand there by the door and open the door and say, welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, that's so important. That's, um, that, but I'm not saying you have to stand by the door, but just, you know what I mean, just to be there. Just to be there. And by the way, uh, there's a man by the name of Philip Yancey whose writings I always enjoy reading. But he said uh, he, in his Christian life, got to where he wondered if... This duty, like, okay, some of you are beginning to read the Bible through again this year, and you're reading Genesis again for the umpteenth time, and those, those chronologies uh, might become <laughs> wearisome, some of them, if you let them, and you're saying, okay, this is just routine. This is just, I've done this so many times. I'm just going to be spontaneous. I'm just going to, I'm not going to have a regular pattern. I'm not going to read three chapters a day. I'm not going to pray 20 minutes or 40 minutes or an hour each day at the same place, same time. I'm just going to get out of that regular routine pattern because I just do it out of, out of duty and not out of what, I, what excites, what's exciting, what's, what's thrilling to my soul. Yancey said he went through that period of life. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to abandon the regular, regularity of what I do. And coming to church every Sunday morning is part of that regularity. But he said, you know something? He said, I found it didn't work. He said, I found that there's more spontaneity in regularity than there is in spontaneity, period, without regularity. He said, when I, when I come in the regular pattern with an open heart, God just sometimes lays something on me that I wasn't expecting. Uh, in fact, uh, this Yancey quoted another writer that he'd, he'd read, uh, and I want to just put it, give you her, her words. Her name is Nancy Mayer. She's an author. She said, "When I come to, when I come to, let me read it." He says, uh, "I come to write. I come to my typewriter every morning to to write." Uh, I approach prayer the same way. I keep on whether it feels like I'm profiting or not. I show up in hopes of getting to know God better, perhaps hearing from him in ways accessible only through solitude. The English word meditate means to rehearse. And he said, this is Yancey speaking, often my prayers seem like a kind of rehearsal. Uh, I go over the basic notes, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, practice familiar pieces, the Psalms, and try out a few new tunes, mainly. Mainly, he said, I just show up. Just show up. I've heard Pastor Huffhand say that. It's just a matter of showing up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it may seem monotonous. It could be repetitious. It might be at times inglorious, but just show up. And uh, God will not disappoint you. He will be there, and he will speak to you. So it is our, it is our duty of, un, we have a duty of undaunted service. Uh, secondly, we have a duty of 
undivided submission. It's our duties to submit uh, to His will, our Savior's will, and His wisdom. We don't question Him. I think of, of uh, Romans chapter 9. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, he's got a will for you. He's got a plan for every life. Uh, and his plan for your life is different than his plan for anybody else's life. And you look at other people and you say, man, I, I wish the Lord had given me that opportunity. I wish the Lord had made me this way. I wish the Lord had given me that gift that I could use for his glory. And you might look at other people and say, man, alive, I feel like I got shortchanged. Uh, why didn't you do this, Lord? Why didn't you uh, allow me to to have this ministry? And no, notice what it says in Romans chapter 9. Nay, but, O oh man, verse 20. Who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay and of the same lump to make one vessel to honor and another to dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath, fitted destruction, and so forth? So God, <laughs> he made us just the way he wanted to make us. He fashioned you just the way he wanted to, and equipped you and gave you, by the Holy Spirit, a spiritual gift, a specific, maybe two or three, but at least one gift with which you can serve him. Don't look at other people and say, I wish I had. You know, I could say, I wish I had David's gift to sing and play. Oh, my goodness. I, I could say that, and I could really mean it, because I really wish I could. Or his gift on the piano, or his gift to preach, or your gift to do whatever you do. I, I could say that sincerely, but then I would have to come back to the fact that, why, why am I questioning God? Who am I to reply Hath, uh, shall the thing form say to him that form it, Why hast thou made me thus? You made me just the way you wanted to, to make me, Lord, so it's my job just to just to roll up my sleeves and do the work you want me to do. It's my duty. It's my duty uh, to give you undivided submission, not to question your will for my life, uh, not to second-guess your uh Wisdom for my life, just to to do what you want me to do. Dr. Bob Jones, uh, Jr., or Dr. Bob Sr., who founded Bob Jones University, said he'd read in the paper the other day, so this goes years back. He said, I read in the paper where uh, President Roosevelt was overseas and his son recently uh, was over in the area. He was on duty in the Army, I think it was. And he uh, when the president visited that area, the uh, commander in chief of the army gave President Roosevelt's son an order to go visit his dad. That was an order, so he did. He went. He walked in. His, Bob, Doctor Bob said he walked into the presence of his father. As a soldier of his country, he owed a salute to his commander in chief. That would be his dad. As a son of a father, he owed him a kiss. And Dr. Bob said the article in the paper said he paid both debts. He saluted his dad because he was the commander in chief, and he also gave his dad a kiss because, or a hug because he was his dad, his father. Dr. Bob said, it went on to say, and he used these illustrations like only he could do, duties never conflict. I owe a duty to my wife, a duty to my son, a duty to my grandchildren, a duty to my daughter-in-law, a duty, a duty to Bob Jones College, a duty to my country, a duty to my God. And in God's universe, his commands never conflict, never under any circumstances keep your relations right. When you overpay one obligation by subtracting from another, you're sinning against God. A lot of preachers have done that. I've read testimonies of preachers and probably people in other uh, walks of life, too, where they have uh, overpaid in one area. I mean, they've given their whole being, uh, all of their waking moments to a pursuing a career or pursuing a ministry, which is good, but they've neglected their home, <laughs> neglected their children, neglected their wife, uh, even neglected God because they've gotten wrapped up into the routine of ministry. Well, the duty of submission 
And then finally, the duty of, of undying support. We are to give our Lord Jesus Christ undying loyalty. We support him. We, we uh, serve him. We love him. And I said undying because it's even unto death. That's, Roman, that's a Revelation chapter 3. Let me read it to you. <clears throat> it was a promise given to the church at Smyrna, I believe it was. Yes, Revelation chapter 3 uh, and verse 21. It might be the, the church of Pergamos. I'll read it here. I'll get it in a minute. <laughs> um, I've got the... Um, Bear with me, please. I don't do this often, by the way. Anyway, Jesus said, he said, if you will be faithful even unto death, I'm going to give you a crown of life. That's the verse I'm looking for. It's probably, well, I, I still am not coming up with it. But trust me, it's there. I got Revelation 3 to 1, but that's not it. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life, Jesus said to the church. It says it to, to us today. Be faithful. Be faithful unto death. Even, I'm going to give you a crown of life. So the way, of, the way of duty is often rugged, but it's always royal. It's the king's highway. It's the way to being blessed of God and receiving his blessing. I hope that you are on that way today. I hope that you have pledged undying support. Uh, we, my wife and I attended a memorial service for a pastor this past week, uh, Pastor Jerry Cummins. He pastored over in uh, uh, in Danville, Illinois, First Baptist Church for, I think, 20, maybe 18 years, many years, and a faithful man of God. Uh, he was, uh, he, he started out in, in Paris, Illinois, planted a church. I don't know if you've ever been to Paris, Illinois. I have. I held a meeting there once back in the years, a, a revival meeting for a faithful pastor that was there and invited me over. And Paris, Illinois, used to be back in the probably 30s, a place where Al Capone's gang went down to Paris, Illinois, to get out of Chicago for a while when the when it got hot in Chicago. When they had, it. and then they then they went down to. French Lick later also in Indiana. But anyway, Paris, Illinois, and by the time, by the time I held a meeting there, it was, it was not a great town, but it was a small town. And this pastor was struggling just to get a work. Uh, but this pastor, Pastor Cummins had started a church there. And then he was, he, he pastored in Hidalgo, Illinois. Ever heard of that? It's off Interstate 70. No, you haven't, probably haven't heard much about Paris, Illinois or Hidalgo. But he was faithful in those works. Started one in Paris and then pastored in Hidalgo. And maybe I'm not sure where else, but then he ended up in First Baptist Church in Danville, which uh, is a well-known church and uh, a church where it has a great mission outreach, missionary outreach. And he had a good ministry there. And his children and his grandchildren stood up and blessed his name and spoke of his faithfulness and uh, a deacon of the church, a doctor, stood up and, and read uh, or gave a tribute of, to Pastor Cummins. He's not a well-known pastor nationally. <laughs> uh, he's just known mostly in his area there in, uh, in eastern Illinois. Uh, but he was faithful, faithful to his call. Uh, went to Paris. Uh, I don't I forget where he grew up, but he grew up in a small town in Illinois. Then uh, went to Paris, started the church. Then Hidalgo, uh, just a spot on the map. Most of, most of us haven't heard, but faithful there. And then God put him in Danville, and he spent many years there. He retired, and then he was after he retired officially from uh, being a senior pastor. He was also pastor in, or at least he helped out in another ministry. He was busy right up to the end. Great. You know, that's the, that's the way any one of us want to end, being faithful even unto death, uh, even unto the day that uh, God calls us home. That's where we want to just be faithful. I know that's what you want to do. That's what I want to do. So, but remember, uh, 
In John 13, 16, the servant's not greater than his Lord. Uh, we are in his house, but we're not over his house. We're just servants. Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You know, the best way we can serve God is just to roll up our sleeves and, and do the things that he's commanded us to do. He's commanded us to, to love the brethren. He's commanded us to uh, be faithful. He's commanded us to, to give of our time and our talent and our, our tithe unto his work, his ministry, to give to missions. He's commanded us to, uh, to serve, to serve one another. Many commands. Well, are you, are, are you doing those? Why do you call him Lord, Lord, and, and then do not the things which he says to do? We, we need to do that. And by the way, when we've done all of them that we can think to do, and we, we've, we've put our head on our pillow at night and said, Lord, I think I've been faithful today. I've, I've done those things which you wanted me to do. I believe I've maybe mentioned some. Then, then, then you can say to yourself, but God, I've only been an unfa un unprofitable servant. Servant, I've just been unprofitable. <laughs> you didn't need me. You could have used somebody else. Uh, I've just, I've just done my duty. What I've been commanded to do. I'm just an unprofitable servant. Oh God, your grace is so good to allow me to serve you. And you remember our frame. You know that we're dust. You do not mark our iniquities against us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for putting up with me today. And, and I can't wait to see you, and I want to hear you say, Well done, unprofitable servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I will make you rule over many. Father in heaven, give us the right spirit. Give us the right attitude. Help us never look upon holy things as repetitious or monotonous or inglorious, unexciting. But every time we open the Bible, help us to be excited about what you might tell us, what you might show us that we, we haven't really considered before. Bless this church as we look into the year ahead. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. When I drove up to the stop sign across the street today, it looked different than it did the last time I drove up. Things are changing. Things will continue to change. That's life. But help us not to change. Help us to be undaunted and undying in our loyalty. And as we sing today, unmovable in our stand for Jesus. Bless Pastor Huffman as he leads this church. Bless this church. I pray it would be a great year ahead. For Jesus' sake and in his name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen.